Jesus is in this house. The story of the Great Commission or the account of the Great Commission, if you look at the, the, the Gospels at the end of each one of the Gospels, the first three, you see that Jesus ends up in the house where his most faithful followers are sitting in fear, sitting in doubt. And the one thing that I think Jesus truly wanted them to know was that he was there. That he was not only there, but everything that had taken place up until that very moment when he appeared out of nowhere in that room, that he had fulfilled all of God's plans from the beginning and the inception of time, which time is for us. Time is not for God. God supersedes time. And so God wants us to give him the glory, but we can't give him the glory if we don't trust him. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 24, because there are some things that we need to know. Last week was in Matthew 28, and that's the standard, go you therefore and teach all nations, the Great Commission, and we backed it up a little bit, and we saw some of, some of the behavior. I want you to know this morning, if you get nothing else out of this this morning, that the disciples were no different than you and I. They had lives, they had wives, they had fears, they had doubts, they, they were frightened, they, they were everything that we are, they were, were real human beings, and the difference in their lives was Jesus. They chose to follow him as, as, as he walked down the Sea of Galilee, and he said, you know, come follow me, and they left and followed him, but they were going to know him in a way that they could not have ever known him as he remained in the flesh because they would receive the Holy Spirit, and we read that in the book of Acts. But the Great Commission is Jesus lining his people up, preparing them to go and do battle against the gates of hell, literally, to go and take the reality that Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the way and the truth and the life. He is all that, that he proclaimed to be. He's all that the Old Testament said he was going to be in the coming Messiah, the fulfillment of Israel's want. And yet God in his sovereignty knew that they would not accept him. And they didn't. And they crucified him. And they put him in a tomb. And he died a physical death. And if he would have stayed in the tomb, we wouldn't be here this morning. But he rose from the grave. That stone was rolled away. And Jesus emerged as the conquering king, defeating death, defeating sin, and defeating Satan. And so with that reality that we know as 21st century Christians... They didn't have that assurance then. That yes, they had walked with Jesus, but you got to understand, and we have to understand that doubt and fear are real things that they struggled with back then and that we struggle with now. But Jesus had some words for them. That he had some things they needed to know, and he's got some things that, that we need to hang our hats on this morning, that we need to be so assured of so that when we get angry, that we don't sin. That when we doubt, we don't sin. When we're fearful, that we rely on Him. So if you've got your Bible, and if you would turn to the 24th chapter of the book of Luke, and I want to begin in... I'm going to back up to verse 28, and I'm going to read through verse... 49, and then I'm just going to kind of break it apart for us. So let me begin in verse 28. And they approached the village. Let me tell you who they are. They are the two men that walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus had a conversation with them, and then he went and he had a meal with them, and then he revealed himself to them, and then he disappeared. And so verse 28 picks up at that very moment. When Jesus is going to, to begin to interject himself back into the lives 
of his disciples. So let me begin in verse 28. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going further, that he is Jesus. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven disciples and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon, Simon Peter. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. And I'll get, hopefully I'll remember to come back to that. Verse 36, while they were telling these things, he himself, Jesus, stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? You got any food? Hang on to that thought for a second too. Then he gave them, they, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until, until you are clothed with power from on high. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray that we would see how awesome you are in this, and how, how much care you took in preparing the disciples and all those that were with them for the future. Father, sometimes we read so quickly and we miss some of the intricacies of your word. Father, may we see the truth in this this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I, I want to hit some, some things because I don't want them to forget these. And what happens is I get going and I forget. Look at verse 41. He said, have, have you got anything to eat? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why Jesus who just risen from the dead? Why he cared about food? Have you, anybody, raise your hand if you've ever thought about that. You know why he did that? Because they thought he was a spirit. They thought he was a ghost. And you know one of the, one of the, the teachings on, on the spirit world is they have no bodies. They, they don't need food. Jesus wanted his disciples and his followers to know that he had fulfilled the Father's plan completely, and that he rose physically, not just spiritually, from the grave. That he defeated death, because if Jesus didn't defeat death, then he didn't do the will of the Father. He didn't fulfill the Old Testament scripture. So he fulfilled it completely, and his disciples needed to know that he was who he said he was. They needed to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that there could be no doubt that he had died that he was dead, but that he was alive in the flesh. Because that's what Scripture said, that he would rise again. And so, so God in his sovereignty is going, here, church, and it wasn't born yet, here, followers, I'm 100% faithful to my word. And now why was that important? 
because he was going to do something to them that, that we have the privilege of every day because the Spirit lives with us. He opened their minds to Scripture. He showed them things that we, don't, we aren't privy to exactly what he showed them, but he opened their minds and made, allowed them and, and made them ready to basically go and storm the gates of hell with the gospel of who Jesus Christ is. So God took care of his people. And you have to realize, and we have to realize, this was the darkest day in the life of the church or the darkest three days in the life of the church. Everything they believed, everything they'd hoped for, everything they thought would happen through Jesus was blown out of the water when he died. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read that conversation between the, between the two men and Jesus on the road to Emmaus, by the way, they didn't recognize, they didn't know who he was. They were shocked when Jesus started talking to them that he didn't know about himself. And that he had basically, they had all these hopes and all these dreams and, and yet he died. And so Jesus is affirming and assuring his followers that I am who I said that I am, and who the Father said that I am. And I will always be the Messiah, the Son of God, the propitiation, the price for your sin. And he wanted to assure them that he is worth it. I fear in our modern world that we sometimes doubt that Jesus Christ is worth our all. And you see that in teaching, you hear that in sermons, you, 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 you see that in the way people live their lives, teetering here and teetering there. And this isn't about legalism, it's about love. It's about loving Jesus more than we love everything else. Because God proved his love towards us in this very moment. When Jesus rose from the grave, that, that's awesome, that, that changes our eternity. But it doesn't just stop there. Think about a time when, in your life when you were full of doubt and fear, when you wondered about what tomorrow was going to look like to, to, to such an extent that, 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 that you mourned and, and maybe you wept or cried and, and got discouraged, got depressed, got anxious, and you just had no idea what tomorrow would hold. Have you ever been there? Most of us have been there. It's a horrible place to end up, but it's even a more horrible place to live. And so Jesus comes and says, I am proving to you that I am the Savior. And now why is that important? Why is it important that we believe, that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for sin, and that he died for them? Because we're the only thing, they were the only thing at that moment that stood between, between Rome, between Judaism, between all the pagan gods, all the pagan religions. Jesus was putting them in the gap for all of, all of the world. And he was going to be, or they were going to be his spokespeople, and he was going to live their life, live, live, sorry, live his life through them and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so Jesus had some marching orders for them, and that's what we call the Great Commission. And he tells them in, in, in this one for Luke, he says, you guys are just going to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> just like I said, you're going to be in Jerusalem. See, Luke, Luke didn't, for whatever reason, and I think I know why, Luke, Luke didn't spring it all on him. Matthew did. Mark does. Luke doesn't, but they were going to be the church. They were going to springboard from these, from these, these weirdo guys that were following Jesus. Some were fishermen. There was a tax collector. There was a Matthew, a tax collector. Luke, a doctor. There were fishermen. There were nobodies. And Jesus was going to use them, and God the Father was going to use them to literally change the destiny of the world. And so how did he prepare them for that? Let's go back. First, in verse 36, he says, you know, peace. Peace be to you guys. Well, hey, y'all. 
How's it going? I hope all is well. Peace be with you. Peace is something that we as Christians don't live in enough. And I think that's why Jesus says it here, and that's why Paul says it, because peace is part of, it's, it's part of the program. He says, you get to know what it means to be rock solid with the creator of the world, to be rock solid with, with, the, with the sovereign savior of the world. You can know that in the midst of every circumstance, there is hope and there is possibility and there is peace because of who Jesus is. He says that. So he, he, and, and he didn't go, he, he didn't do this. Gary, I'm going to go out of the frame. He didn't do this. Anybody home? He didn't do that. You know what he did? He literally just appeared out of nowhere. You know why? Because he could. He didn't... He didn't have to, to re, react, relate the, the way that they expected. And so he just showed up in their midst and said, oh, what? be peaceful. And they're like, ooh, I can't be peaceful. We're scared to death. He says, peace be with you. And they begin to doubt and they begin to fear. And he says, well, guys, just look at my hands. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. And so I'm sure they look at it, and he goes, no, touch him, feel, this isn't stage, this is real, I am him, I am Jesus, the one that you followed, and I died on a cross for your sins. He said, it's real, it's the reality. And he basically says, you have to believe this. You have to trust. You have to have faith. And so he says, he says, look, touch, feel, and believe. Verse 40 says, well, let me read 38. Why are you troubled and why do, you, why, do you, why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then he says he showed him their hands and his feet. And then he says, got anything to eat? So do you see how that all fits together? They needed to believe that Jesus was Jesus. Folks, we got to believe that Jesus is Jesus. And so here's what we have to do. This is what we need to do. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember how lost in our sin we were. Even if we met Christ at the age of seven, we were still separated from Jesus Christ by sin. But a lot of us were teenagers or, or adults when we came to Christ, and we've been a Christian for a long time. We have to remember what he saved us from. Because I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt, that, that if you're a Christian today and you've been a Christian for a long time, if he hadn't saved you, you wouldn't be here this morning. You'd be lost in your sin. And so we have to remember where we came from. The disciples had to remember who and where they came from. Because here was the mission of the disciples to take the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, into their hometown, Jerusalem, into Judea, would be our Colorado, to Samaria, which would be everywhere that's foreign outside of Colorado, and to the uttermost parts of the world, that they were going to take the reality of who Jesus was, not just who he was, but who he was in their lives, and they were going to share their testimonies and share their lives with other people, telling them what Jesus had done for them and who he was. I know I mentioned this last week, and you probably remember if you were here during the youth testimonies. Do you remember what the number one fear was for the youth when they, and the adults on the mission trip? Knocking on people's doors. Going and actually, as they were going, telling others about Jesus Christ. But the one thing that I heard was that the more we did it, the easier it became. 
Jesus says, that's you guys. That's all of you and you're all going to do that. You're all going to be my witnesses, and I'm going to send you, and you're going to make disciples, which literally means making Christ followers and teaching them to observe Scripture. Luke didn't just pick words out, out of the sky. Okay, he says this. He said, verse 45, Then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Folks, we got, we got to... We got to know that if we don't know the word of God, then we don't know Jesus, and we don't know God the Father, and we don't know the Holy Spirit the way he wants us to know them. We don't have an understanding of why God does what he does and who we are in Christ, because we, as human beings, are very circumstantial. We allow the circumstances of our lives to dictate how we feel, how we think, and what we believe. And if we are students of the scripture, if we're, if we're accepting and receiving the discipleship and the training and the teaching that comes from scripture, then, then we begin literally a, literally a lifelong journey of, of becoming more like Christ, understanding the whys and the what fors and the hows. And with that comes a, a, an understanding of peace, an understanding of joy, an, an understanding of, of what it means to be a Christian. And how we are, we literally are called out from the world to be Christ followers. And so that's what Jesus is instilling in those 11 and all those that had gathered around. He said, you guys are going to be my representatives everywhere. Everywhere. At school. At Arby's. At Chick-fil-A. At the mall at the airport, at the baseball games, at the football games, on the hiking trails. You are going to be my witnesses everywhere you go. When you're sitting behind the car in traffic and you want to go faster, and traffic is slow, yeah, it hits home with me too. And you want to honk your horn. You want to roll down your window. I was sitting in traffic. I was, it was a long, it was like a tw it was five minutes. It felt like 20. I was having to wait out here. And I'm, I've got my music going, and I'm fine. But all of a sudden, this guy behind me starts honking his horn. And I turn my music up a little bit louder because that irritates me. Because I'll do this, but I won't honk my horn. And he kept honking his horn. And I kept thinking to myself, what are we supposed to do, buddy? Does it make you feel better to do this? And I so wanted to get out of the car and ask him that, but I didn't because I'm smarter than that. But the guy with the flag, with the, with the, with the stop sign, walked over and knocked on his car and said, would you please stop that? He said, we're moving you as fast as we possibly can. And he turned around and he walked away and he, he looked at me and he just winked. And I know it was for me, it was all for me. But the guy stopped honking his horn. See, we can be that guy with the horn. We can be that obnoxious person that is really just a jerk or an idiot. But how do, does that represent Jesus well? And so here's what Satan does to us. It's, he finds that weak moment, that weak area in our, in our lives, and he exploits it for us. And we begin to, to have struggles, and we begin to, to think that, well, I don't deserve, just an example, I've got, I'm a busy guy, I don't deserve to have to sit in traffic. Why me? And so we think, why me? And all of a sudden, we begin to think that, that we're owed something. Or we think that, that we shouldn't have to suffer. Why do the innocent suffer? I have to suffer in traffic. In Grand Junction. Yeah, give me a break, Ray. Go to Denver, go to Los Angeles, go to, go to Dallas. But yet, go, guys, we, we get in this mindset, and it begins to consume us, and we get angry. Am I the only one that does this in very, very different areas? Am I the only one that needs to see a priest? <laughs> Scott's there, thank you. But we want what we want when we want it, and when we don't get it, 
we stumble bad. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, literally, you guys are stumbling now. You're already doubting. You're already questioning. And you're so excited that I'm here that you're still being stupid. You still don't believe. That's what he says. You still don't get it. And so he opens their minds so they can understand Scripture. And we can't lessen this for ourselves. When we read Scripture, the Holy Spirit of God allows us to understand Scripture in a way that we could never understand apart from Him. Which is why it's so important that we learn and read and study the Word of God. Because it's Scripture. It's God's holy Word. And that's how we get to know Him better. And so here's what we get to do, is we get to read Scripture. We get to understand Scripture. And then we begin to put things into perspective. We begin to, to take life situations and, and we, we, we compare it to what God's Word says. And, oh, I see why this happened. Or I don't see why this happened, but I believe, I believe God said all things will work together for good because I do love Him. And we begin to have this deeper understanding because we have a deeper walk with God. And that's what the disciples needed. Because if they didn't have that, they were going into the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke, that was going to literally rock the foundation of everything they believed and about themselves. So here's what Jesus said to them. Verse 49, well, 48. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father, that promise is the promise of the Holy Spirit, upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So do you get what he's saying? Don't be foolish. You don't have the power. You will have the power. You've seen me. You've touched. You believe. You, you're, you're grasping it. Your minds have got scripture. But you're not ready yet. You're not ready. So you need to obey by staying here until you get what I've got for you. I, that's really important. Just a, another quick poll. How many of you have ever read Acts chapter 1 and 2? The majority of us. Acts chapter 1 and 2 would not be read the same way if they did not obey Jesus. And I'll tell you why. Because Peter cut off this dude's ear. Remember? In the garden? They've come to collect Jesus and Peter goes, you're not taking him. Whack! And he cuts off guy's ear. And Jesus basically looks at him and says, Peter, pff, and puts the ear back on and the guy walks on. Because they were so impulsive, they were so, they were so human. And Jesus is on the cross and everybody runs. And Jesus is in a tomb and two women come and recognize that Jesus isn't there anymore and, and they go and tell the disciples and they don't believe him. And these two that come from Emmaus come and tell the disciples and they don't believe him either because they were doubtful and they were full of fear and they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. And they had to wait for the promise of God to give them the power to be his witnesses. But I have good news for us. If you're a Christian, the very moment you profess faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes and takes up residence in your heart. And he lives in you. And you have the power of God living in you. Do you know that? Nod your heads. You all know that. And so from the moment we profess faith in Christ, we've got what the disciples had to wait for. We got who the disciples had to wait for. And so you know what our call is? Is to go and make disciples. To go and tell others what Jesus has done for us. 
to go tell others what the Bible says about Jesus, to show them how, how we are the new creations that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, that we have been born again of the Spirit, not of flesh and blood, as John writes in John 3, that we are who Jesus said that we could be, his followers. Even with our flaws and our, our, our blemishes and, and our stumbles and our sin and our falling and, and all that makes us human beings, Jesus said, you're mine, and I love you. And so I just want us to go back to the, to the seashore, to the Sea of Galilee as his disciples are fishing, those fishermen that they were, as he walks by, and he says, just follow me. Just follow. That's all you have to do is follow me, and I'll lead you into the truth. I'll lead you into life, and I won't leave you there. I'll be with you every step of the way, but you got to follow. The end of Luke chapter 24 was Jesus telling his disciples before he ascended into heaven, follow me. Follow me. And that's what he's telling us this morning. Follow him. With every breath that we have, with every hope and every dream that we would follow him and let him put the perspective on our lives. And I ask if you'll stand with me this morning. I got a text on Friday morning and uh, a very good friend of mine informed me that a, a pastor friend of mine died of cardiac arrest on a very unexpectedly. And at that time, nobody knew, and he just wanted me to know because this man was a friend of mine and a friend of our families, and we'd known him for years. And just out of the blue, he just died. Unexpected. Pastor of a church in Fruta, and all of a sudden there is this void. Who's going to be the shepherd of that church? I got a text from one of the, the associate pastors about midnight last night, and he said, we're going on, because this wasn't about him, it's about Jesus. And he just said, would you pray for me? And I just prayed for him. See, that's what God does. He prepares us for the unexpected, because we never know what's going to happen. I'm going to ask if you'll quiet your hearts before God this morning. Bow your heads if you want to. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the Great Commission. I thank you for all of the backstory, for the way we get to see these, these men and these women who, who would be faithful followers of you. Father, we get to see them in all of their doubt and all of their fear. And then all we have to do is begin reading in the next book, in the next chapter the next letter, and we see how, how you take Simon Peter and you, you, take, you take the disciples, you take John, and how you craft and how you mold them and how you use them to fulfill your plan as they follow you. So God, I pray this morning that we would follow their example, that we would lay ourselves at your feet and that we would surrender ourselves to you that we would surrender to being your witness, to being your followers, to being students of Scripture by, by having a devotion, reading your word, and then taking what we read and sharing it with others. God, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the way that you love us, for the truth that you've instilled in us in Jesus. May we truly follow you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a hymn of invitation and do what God tells you to do. Whatever he's impressing upon your heart or on your mind, be faithful. If he says do it, just do it. If you need to talk to me, I'll be up here. Come and, come and take my hand and say, Ray, and fill, the, fill in the blanks. Or maybe God's saying, you know, pray with the person next to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Just do what he says do. We're going to sing.